Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 13th. Today we celebrate the Roman leader who is still honored with flowers. We'll also learn about one of the best botanical writers of all time, and we celebrate the man remembered with the naming of the cottonwood. We also celebrate the life of a beloved English poet through his poetry, and every day on this year, he is still remembered with flowers. And we grow that garden library with a book about a teacher from the Bronx who germinated an idea and started a movement, changing his life and the lives of his students. And then we'll wrap things up with the inspiring story of the Fairchild Tropical Garden. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world and today's curated news. Well, today we have lots of greetings to get to. Lisa M. in Florida says, Please wish my mom and dad a happy anniversary. They're celebrating 52 years of wedded bliss today, and they got married in a garden. Well, what a beautiful story, and what a beautiful picture of the two of them standing in between a row of peonies. Happy anniversary. Then Sonia Edith shared a picture of a little solar fountain that she just put in her garden. And she writes, I got this for my birthday, which was last week. I won't tell you how old I am, but I was so tickled at how easy it was to install. We just dug a hole to put it halfway in the ground, and then we used some field stone that was left over from my garden to quickly put in a flower bed around it. And I'm happy to say that my neighbor just gave me a few water lilies, and they seem to be very happy in their new home. Well, happy birthday. And that's a great present, by the way. The sound of water is so soothing, and I love seeing that element in a garden. Then Jessica Noren wrote in to say, Can you please wish my twins a happy birthday? Here they are helping me earlier this year picking strawberries out of our garden. And they are two sweet little guys. So happy birthday to you both. Then Gail Bauer wrote in to say, Please wish a happy birthday to my best friend and garden buddy, Janine. We go to all the plant sales together. And in fact, we met at one 12 years ago this spring. Great story. And then last but not least, Sarah Olson wrote in with a picture of her basil and said, Happy birthday to me. I'm back at it again, harvesting my favorite plant today and making tons of pesto. Well, Sarah, my kids and I did this exact thing yesterday. We spent over an hour with the basil that I harvested from my small kitchen garden here at the cabin, and we broke out the food processor that I found on a garage sale here two summers ago when we bought this place. So I was really glad to give it some use. Now, of course, I couldn't find any pine nuts at any of the local stores, so I managed to find pine nuts on Amazon. And if you're struggling to find pine nuts where you are, I thought these Amazon pine nuts were actually really good. And I liked the amount because for every batch of pesto that we created in the food processor, it took one bag of these pine nuts. Now, the ones that I ordered were called Nature's Eats Pine Nuts, and they were $4 and 50 cents for two ounces. So you don't get a ton. That's like half a cup. But they were very good, very nice quality. And I think when it was all said and done, we had, I want to say, six packs of pesto ready to go. Now, in addition to the pine nuts, we added olive oil and finely shredded Parmesan cheese. That was fresh. And then some kosher salt. And we don't add that until the very end because we don't want to over-process it. And really, just 15 seconds in the Cuisinart food processor, and that's all it takes. So tonight, I'm making my pesto spaghetti, and I can't wait. So my goal is to record a couple episodes of the show and then get making my pesto spaghetti with my very, very, very fresh pesto. And before I forget, I wanted to remind you that... 
A few years ago, I did a very long podcast. I want to say it's about 90 minutes, and it's completely dedicated to basil, all things basil, including how to make pesto, how to cut your basil so that it comes back, what's the best way to do that to make a bushier, stockier basil plant, how to grow it, how to propagate it, how to grow it in your house over winter. There are just so many tips in this podcast. So that episode is one that I produced for my old podcast called The Still Growing Podcast. And I'll put a link to it in today's show notes. But if you're on your phone right now or at your computer and you just can't wait to check it out, all you have to do is type in The Still Growing Podcast and then the word basil mania all one word, and that show will pop up, and you will know more about basil than you ever thought you would. So happy listening to that if you want to check it out. But, you know, one question I'm planning on asking in the Facebook group is, what is the one herb your kitchen garden will never be without? And for me, that would be basil, no doubt about it. All right, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. Now, if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, all you need to do is send in your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, anniversary wishes, uh, happy friendship wishes, whatever you want, and so forth to me at my email at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. Make sure you send it to the .org and not .com. And the other way that you can get things to my attention is just to post them in the Facebook group for the show. Just head on over to the Daily Gardener community. It's on Facebook. It's a group that you can join. It's 100% free, and you can just post things in there. And if you'd like me to share them in the Gardener Greetings segment, just mention that, or maybe I'll just pick it and I'll share it on the show. And just a friendly reminder that if you're listening to the show while you're at home, just ask Alexa or Google to play the Daily Gardener podcast, and she will. It's just that easy. Here's today's curated news. You know, about a month ago, Real Homes shared a post that caught my attention, and it was called 12 Front Garden Ideas, Inviting Designs to Boost Your Curb Appeal. Now, the reason this got my attention is because so many people during the pandemic wanted to start gardening, and the only place they had to garden was right in their front yard. So I thought this post was such a great one for giving us ideas on how to transform our front yards into a garden space, whether it's for enjoyment or nourishment. And I'm just going to run through a handful of these ideas with you now. And then if you're interested in looking at this post for yourself, just head on over to the Facebook group for the show and type in the number 12 and this post will pop up. But the first thing that they shared, and I thought this was a good one, is keep the root to the front door simple. Now, I completely violated this rule for the past two weeks because I was buying plants like a crazy person as they were going on sale and as I was stumbling on roadside plant sales, which I feel is a very safe way to get plants during the pandemic. So what I did is I put all my plants lined up by the front door and the poor delivery people could barely get to the door to deliver my garden books and other things because there were so many plants up there. But I had done that because it was facing north and so the plants wouldn't get so much sun and it was also near my garden hose so I could actually take care of them until I could get them in the ground. But in general, this post says, keep the root to your front door simple, especially if you're putting in permanent gardens. And even though this sounds completely obvious, I see this all the time when I go visit friends. Sometimes in our zeal to garden, we forget about the fact that people want to get to the front door. So whatever you do, don't block that natural path to your door with a garden keep that path open and your home will feel much more inviting. Their second tip was to choose big plant pots to create an impactful look. You know, I remember when I went through this phase, 
prior to getting my huge containers that I garden in now, I used to have a ton of little pots. And aside from the fact that they're very easy to move, little planters really are great that way, they can be tough for gardeners because they don't retain as much moisture and they don't have the soil volume to really support the room that plants need to flourish. And there's just nothing better than a beautiful large container for a visual punch in your front yard. Anyway, this post does a great job of sharing some pots that really do help create a smarter and more individual look for you. Now, the last tip of theirs that I'm going to share with you is the sixth tip, and it says, pay attention to paintwork in a small front garden. This tip I completely agree with, and it's one I've put into practice here at the cabin. Our cabin, the front of our cabin, has a very small facade, and yet it has a porch. And I like my porches to have tables and chairs, and so lots of different seating options and lots of different spots so I can put all of my garden miscellany. Now, that could look very, very busy if everything was painted different colors. And that's usually how I get my items. The metal table that I put on my front porch was, I think it was green, and then it had been painted white. And then the minute I got it, I immediately painted it out to match the trim on the house. And so I have this beautiful metal table, but now it blends in perfectly with the front of the house And I get all of the function without a visual stop, without the visual clutter of having a color that doesn't go with the house. And I did that same thing with a metal garden bench that I purchased, a couple of the planters that are in the front, as well as this fountain that I bought. Now, the fountain isn't a functioning fountain, but it adds an architectural element to the front of the garden. And in fact, right after I got it, on cue, it got knocked over and it broke in half. So all I did was glue it back together. And then because it was getting painted, no one is the wiser. So again, I get all of the beauty and there's no disruption in the paintwork in the front of the house. And that pulls everything together. All right, there are nine other really great tips in this post. One of them is bound to catch your attention. And again, if you'd like to read through this post for yourself, just search for the number 12 in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop up. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles and blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the Roman leader Julius Caesar. He was born on this day in 100 BC. Romans still lay a wreath at his statue and throw flowers in the forum where Caesar was murdered. And today is the anniversary of the death of Jane Loudon, who married the prolific garden writer and publisher John Claudius Loudon. Jane died on this day in 1858. When her father lost the family fortune and died penniless when Jane was only 17, it marked the beginning of her career writing science fiction In her books, Jane wrote about cultural and technological advancements that eventually came to pass. For instance, the women in Jane's books wore pants. In any case, her successful book, The Mummy, was published anonymously in 1827 in three parts. Now, in one of her books, Jane featured something that she imagined would come to pass, a steam plow. And that notion, that concept, is what attracted the attention of John Claudius Loudon, her future husband. 
Loudon wrote a review of her book. He was very, very positive, but he also wanted to meet the author. Loudon didn't realize that Jane had written the book using a nom de plume. She wrote under the name Henry Colburn. Well, long story short, and much to Loudon's delight, Henry was Jane, and they fell in love and married a year later. Now, the Loudons were considered high society, and they called Charles Dickens a friend. As John and Jane grew old together, John's arms stopped working after an attack of rheumatic fever. As a result, Jane became John's arms, and she handled most of his writing. And when his arms got so bad that surgeons needed to amputate his right arm, they found him in his garden, which he told them he intended to return to immediately after the operation. Two weeks before Christmas in 1843, John was dictating his last book to Jane, and the book was called A Self-Instruction to Young Gardeners. Together, they would often work late into the evening, and on this night, around midnight, John suddenly collapsed into Jane's arms and died. To honor John's memory, Jane completed the book on her own. And today is the anniversary of the death of the American explorer, soldier, and the first presidential candidate of the Republican Party, John Charles Fremont, who died on this day in 1890. Fremont is remembered as the Pathfinder after helping many Americans who were heading west by creating documents and maps of his expeditions. In fact, John and his wife, Jessie, created an entire map of the Oregon Trail. Now, when Fremont saw Nebraska for the first time, he didn't see merely an endless prairie. He saw beauty. To Fremont, the entire state was one big garden, accentuated with fertile soil, swaying grasses, and wildflowers as far as the eye could see. Fremont was one of the first explorers to write about cottonwood trees. He discovered them near Pyramid Lake in Nevada on January 6, 1844. Years later, botanists would name the cottonwood in Fremont's honor, calling it the Populus Fremontii. Cottonwoods are among the fastest growing trees in North America. The cottonwood was sacred to Native Americans. To the Apaches, it was a symbol of the sun. And in northern Mexico, cottonwood boughs were used in funeral rites and were associated with the afterlife. And there's an old Native American legend that tells how the cottonwood tree gave birth to the stars. For a time, the tree held the stars and kept them safe. But then, one late spring, the stars were released until they filled the night sky. And every spring, we can remember the legend when we see the female trees release their star-shaped seeds into the air. Now, when I was growing up, All of the beautiful elm trees at my childhood home succumbed to Dutch elm disease. My parents selected cottonwoods as replacement trees because they knew they would grow quickly, up to six feet or more each year. They simply couldn't stand how naked the house looked without the beautiful large elm trees. In truth, there's no comparison between a cottonwood tree and an elm tree. Elms are regarded as one of the most beautiful trees by landscape painters. Still, cottonwoods do grow quickly, and they make a beautiful sound when the wind blows through their leaves. But be forewarned, because the cottonwood tree grows so quickly, it often has weak wood that can be easily injured or damaged. 
Cottonwood trees are in the poplar species, and only the female trees produce the fluffy cotton seeds that float through the air and collect in your garden and garage in June. In unearthed words, today is the birthday of the English poet John Clare, who was born on this day in 1793. And each year on his birthday, the children of his village make little flower posies, and then they lay them on his grave, where they read poems they've written in his honor. Now, for today's show, I thought we'd wish John Clare a happy heavenly birthday by sharing a few of his poems. This first one's called, All Nature Has a Feeling. All nature has a feeling. Woods, fields, brooks are life eternal. And in silence, they speak happiness beyond the reach of books. There's nothing mortal in them. Their decay is the green life of change, to pass away and come again in blooms revivified. Its birth was heaven, eternal is its stay, and with the sun and moon shall still abide beneath their day and night and heaven wide. And here's a poem from John Clare called July. Loud is the summer's busy song. The smallest breeze can find a tongue, while insects of each tiny size grow teasing with their melodies. Till noon burns with its blistering breath around, and day lies still as death. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Power of a Plant by Stephen Ritz. This book came out in 2017, and the subtitle is A Teacher's Odyssey to Grow Healthy Minds and Schools. Stephen Ritz is the founder of the Green Bronx Machine, and he's devoted his teaching career to improving health and academic results for children in the South Bronx. His work has been featured by major media and documentaries, including Michael Pollan's In Defense of Food, and his TEDx talk has been viewed online over one million times. Dubbed the Pied Piper of Peas, Ritz and his family reside in the Bronx, and they continue to farm with children year-round. Tom Colicchio said, The only thing bigger than the impact Stephen has had on helping countless students understand the importance of their food choices is his infectious personality. The Power of a Plant outlines the remarkable work he has done to date and provides a blueprint for how educators around the world can implement his learnings effectively. This book is 304 pages of Stephen Story, a green teacher from the Bronx who let one idea germinate into a movement and changed his students' lives by learning alongside them. You can get a used copy of The Power of a Plant by Stephen Ritz and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $7. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. On this day in 1986, the Billings Gazette ran a story about the Fairchild Tropical Garden in a post called Florida Garden is a Must for Touring Northerners. It starts out this way. This 83-acre botanical garden just south of Miami's Coconut Grove is a four-season attraction for those who are interested in plants, beauty, or in oddities. The Fairchild Tropical Garden is a distinguished first cousin of the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. But be forewarned that a visit can quickly reduce the most seasoned gardener to amateur status. 
you may know all about the different kinds of iris and lilacs, all about how to prune raspberries or harden off tomato starts, and you may even know your way around rare shrubs and trees. But what do you know about lily pilly, bushman's poison, cannonball trees, or shower of orchid vines? A trip to Fairchild Tropical Garden is like a trip to a foreign country. Actually, several foreign countries. There are more than 4,000 different plants here from all around the world. There are ficus trees considerably larger than the one under your skylight. In fact, only a few representative species are grown here because of the great area that each mature one requires. A single ficus tree has been known to cover acres. Ficus means fig, and some kinds do bear edible fruit. So do members of the philodendron family, which grow outdoors year-round here. One called Monstera deliciosa, believe it or not, sets fruit that is among the world's most delectable. And there are jewel-colored tropical water lilies, orchids that bloom year-round on the grounds, the orange and purple bird of paradise, and the Colombian flamingo flower, or anthurium, which looks a little bit like a shiny red patent leather calla lily. Many of the plants are definitely odd. The 40-foot-tall cannonball tree, a native timber tree in some South African countries, produces fragrant, fleshy, six-inch purple blossoms on strange, special branches that the trunk sprouts near the ground at flowering time. These are followed by eight-inch rusty cannonballs dangling from heavy strings suspended from the trunk. They make a noise when the wind blows them against one another. In their native South American countries, these cannonballs are often hollowed out and turned into drinking cups. Another curiosity is the calabash tree, whose egg-shaped fruit, when dried and filled with seed or BB shot, becomes the maracas that are familiar in Latin music. The garden is named after Dr. David Fairchild, an American plant explorer responsible for introducing many important species and varieties of plants to us, like soybeans and dates, and improved varieties of rice, wheat, and cotton. Fairchild was a close friend of the garden's founder, a New York tax attorney named Colonel Robert H. Montgomery. Montgomery was the co-founder of what is today the world's largest accounting firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Montgomery spent his fortune on collecting tropical plants and providing a place for them to grow. And today, that place is the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, and it's located at 10901 Old Cutler Road in Miami. Now, during the pandemic, the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden is open every day from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. with special times available for seniors and for individuals who identify as vulnerable. For your safety and theirs, guests and members must pre-register for timed entry. You can reserve your time ticket and review their COVID policies and procedures on their website. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. 
Wine. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.